Hello, friends of human spaceflight, and welcome to another Week in Review as we look into the space industry and notable launch activities from around the world. Coming up, no rest for SpaceX with not one, but two launches, and on the same day, thank you very much. We take a look at a Starlink launch and another rideshare mission with some really interesting passengers taking the trip. Astro Liz and her Young Explorers Fund is on the move. So what has this special young lady been up to? Incredible imagery has emerged from the USGS about Mars. Just wait until you see this. Hand in hand with the double header launch this week, SpaceX recapped their launch history in a cool graphic that leaves you in no doubt they are the masters of reusability. Heaps to cover this week, folks, so let's go. Straight into it at the start of the week with SpaceX sitting at Space Launch Complex 4A at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. In the wee hours of Monday morning, June 12th, Falcon 9 lifted off at 3.10 a.m. with 52 Starlink satellites sitting atop the now nine-time flight-proven booster for this mission, which also happened to be a converted Falcon Heavy side booster. Being able to quickly convert these boosters adds flexibility to mission choices. The core stage ascent made for quite the sight here, making its way through the throttle bucket and past max Q. That term, in case you don't know, means the throttle level versus elapsed time. If you plot it on a graph, it looks like a bucket. Well, shortly after we had main engine cutoff and stage separation, followed quickly by fairing jettison, exposing the payload to the vacuum of space for the first time. As the second stage powered away, focus switched to the core stage making its way home. Around eight and a half minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9 first stage returned to Earth for a pinpoint ninth landing on the SpaceX drone ship, just read the instructions, which was stationed in the Atlantic Ocean some 637 kilometers downrange. The webcast ended soon after nominal orbit insertion. Successful payload deployment was later confirmed on media. This batch of satellites will, over time, slowly rise to 530 kilometers circular low Earth orbit. This takes the Starlink internet satellite count to around 4,200, with a long way to go. But this is still an incredible tally, that's for sure. Some 14 hours later, we were back at another launch pad, which is where we now pick up the action with our West Coast correspondent, Sam. How'd it go over there, buddy? Thanks, Sam. Well, over on the West Coast now, and incredibly, the second launch in the same day for SpaceX, some 14 hours after the Starlink 511 mission. SpaceX transporter missions are always fun to watch. This time, there were 72 satellites to deliver to space for a variety of customers as part of the Transporter 8 mission, the eighth dedicated mission under the SmallSat rideshare program. Of course, who can forget SpaceX's first dedicated rideshare mission? Transporter 1 launched in January 2021 and holds the record for most satellites launched on a single rocket at 143 satellites to orbit. Back to the mission at hand now, and it was all systems go here with liftoff as planned at 2.35 p.m. local time from Space Launch Complex 4 East, Vandenberg Space Force Base, California. Thanks, Sam. The core stage accelerated away and hurtled skyward with ease. Once through max Q, it was soon time for the usual sequence of events, and right on Q, there was main engine cutoff and stage separation. The fairings also soon shed away from the craft as the second stage poured onward into space. Awesome views here as the core stage made its way back to Earth. With altitude dropping, speed was being stripped off the booster thanks to the thicker atmosphere. The final speed arresting break was achieved with one final engine ignition, the grid fins changing the core stage's center of gravity and steering it back to its destination. The booster finally touched down at landing zone 4 around 400 meters from the launch site. And there we have it, the 200th successful booster recovery, and boy don't they make it look just so routine now. Huge congratulations to the team at SpaceX from all of us here at 2TF and TSMG. Back to payloads now as we wrap up this segment, and yep, you guessed it, it's that time again when we here on the production team love to embellish the footage with special sound effects for your enjoyment. And here we go, all manner of space popping goodness unfolds before our eyes, with 72 assorted spacecraft unleashed into the vacuum of space over the next 24 minutes. Launcher's Orbital Transfer Vehicle, OTV, or Space Tug, 
is quite a deal. The roughly 200 kilogram spacecraft carried assorted smaller satellites to their intended altitude of operations. Launcher OTV was designated SN3 for this mission and marked its return to flight after a failure with SM1 to deploy its passengers during the Transporter 6 mission back at the start of 2023. Transporter 7 launched in mid-April. A subset payload sharing the ride in the Launcher OTV is of particular interest as well. If all goes to plan, Starfish Space could achieve a first with their craft named Otter Pup, docking and undocking an autonomous space vehicle using electric propulsion. The demonstration here is hoped to one day pave the way to make service, reposition and even disposal of satellites commonplace. Also along for the ride, and seen deploying here, was Australian made Skycraft 3, a prototype air traffic management satellite stack. Skycraft will soon populate its low Earth orbit constellation with around 200 plus satellites over the next two years. This will make for a significant contribution to radically enhanced aviation safety, surveillance and communications. How so? Well, aircraft use automatic dependent surveillance broadcast to display position and altitude on screens without the need for radar. Radar is great when there are adequate ground stations listening and relaying that information to air traffic control, but when it comes to real-time data and knowing exactly where the aircraft are, we can do much better. Specifically for monitoring remote and oceanic trips, despite an exemplary aviation safety record in Australia, currently aircraft can only be monitored up to a few hundred kilometers offshore before other surveillance methods are required. Skycraft will be shaking things up considerably in the near future, taking already proven terrestrial based services into space. So now, in addition to providing air navigation service providers with real-time data, they will complement this with seamless real-time voice and data communications directly between air traffic control and the cockpit on a global scale. Leveraging the lower launch costs that SpaceX reusability and rideshare missions now offer, Skycraft will be uniquely positioned to provide a second to none service to the aviation sector around the world. And that is just another example of how SpaceX's low cost rideshare missions are literally changing the world. SpaceX published a visualization of their Falcon 9 launches, including Falcon Heavy. It reflects really well on the effects of the reusability. Falcon 9 is the very first rocket which lands its first stage instead of dropping it into the ocean or onto the endless Kazakh steppes. We saw endless footage of the landing procedure. Well, not exactly endless, as SpaceX just recently achieved a milestone. 200 successful landings. There were many doubts about reusing the first stage. At first, everyone said that it was impossible. SpaceX did it. Then they said that a first stage could only be used two, maybe three times tops. SpaceX stepped over this limit. Then they said that it's not worth it economically because the refurbishment of the stage would cost too much. SpaceX proved the complete opposite by the sheer volume of their launches. All this while no other launch provider has ever landed a first stage in an orbital launch operation. We know there was the STS shuttle, a kind of mixture of a first stage and last stage, but that's a very different concept. So what are the ongoing efforts to catch up with SpaceX? Over at ULA with Vulcan, Tori chose another way of reusability. They only plan to reuse the engine bay segment of the first stage and won't reuse the boosters either. The European Space Agency has a long program with Themis aiming for the same kind of reusability as the Falcon 9 by reusing the first stage. Themis is planned to fly in 2025 and it will help develop the Ariane Next, also known as SALTO, Reusable Strategic Space Launcher Technologies and Operations. Ariane Next is planned to fly in 2030. Proceeding to the east, Roscosmos is developing its Angara rocket, which will have a Baikal variant that will reuse its first stage by flying back to the launch site as an airplane with wings and landing on a runway. Also another Russian development is the Amur rocket with a strong resemblance to SpaceX's Falcon 9. ISRO are working on a reusable launch vehicle technology demonstrator. It will hopefully lead to a fully reusable space launch system about the same level as SpaceX's Starship program. We should note that RLVTD is only the first step on the road to this ambitious goal. In China, the state-owned Cask is working on the fully reusable version of their Super Heavy Long March 9 rocket with test launches in 2033. 
However, China also has a booming private space sector. So what do we see here? iSpace is developing the Hyperbola 2 with first stage recovery. Link Space is on its way to developing VTVL, Vertical Takeoff, Vertical Landing rocket stages, but they have only reached their RLVT6 prototype so far. Palace 1 and Palace 2 are the rockets which are under development by Galactic Energy. We did briefly touch on these in a previous episode, if you recall. Can you feel the energy? The Galactic Energy? These rockets are similar to Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, respectively. The next Chinese company is OneSpace, which is planning to develop a somewhat reusable rocket in their OSOM rocket family. A short hop over the Yellow Sea, the Japanese space agency, JAXA, plans to introduce their reusable rocket in 2030, with a test flight down on the books already for 2026. Peter Beck's company, originally from New Zealand, now based in the US, Rocket Lab has the Neutron rocket in development. Neutron's debut launch is planned for 2024. A complex first stage, together with the openable fairings, will be reused, while a cheap second stage will be expended at each launch. Over in the United States, Relativity is planned to develop their fully reusable and 3D printed Terran R rocket, and Stoke Space is working on their fully reusable system with a second stage using aerospike engines in a circular arrangement. We think these latter two companies are the closest to launching reusable rockets. So, the competitors from all over the globe are chasing SpaceX, but still trailing a little ways yet. And SpaceX is six to eight weeks Elon time, close to the first real orbital test launch of the Starship system, which is again, a next level in this game. If you're looking to invest in the future of space, this is the place to start. The amazing Astro Liz and her Young Explorers Fund. Liz is a 10 year old space enthusiast who will become the first child in the world to send something to the moon when Vulcan's payload, the Peregrine Lander, finally gets off the ground. For the past few years, Liz has been inspiring kids around the world with her STEM experiments, space outreach, and her incredible Summer of STEM initiative in which she has partnered with 15 of the world's leading space organizations to provide free activity packs to children in areas with underfunded STEM programs. Her Astro Liz Young Explorers Fund is raising crucial money to support boys and girls in reaching their space dreams, whether they're looking to start their own community rocketry club, visiting the National Space Center for the first time, or getting to attend their first live rocket launch. Liz's fund is over halfway to reaching its initial goal of 5,000 pounds, which will enable the fund to register as an official charity and access greater support to help children realize their space dreams. Please consider donating to Liz's fund using the link in the description below, and let's help her on her mission to inspire the next generation of explorers. All of the advancements we are making right now will be for nothing if we don't inspire and support young people in pursuing their interests in space. After this episode has ended, why not take a moment to check out Liz's channel, Astro Liz's Lab, link in the description, and you will see that she is extremely deserving of our support and is working incredibly hard to ensure young people have the tools they need to find their place in space. Hit that donation button and let's send this fund into orbit. You can visit astrolizfund.com for more information about this inspiring cause. Thanks to NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and its context camera, it's never been easier to skim the surface of Mars using your mobile device or computer. The special camera on board can capture imagery with a resolution around six meters per pixel and can cover an area up to about 18.5 miles or 30 kilometers wide and around 100 miles or 160 kilometers long. That just blows my mind right there. A swag of high resolution three dimensional images showcase the Martian terrain like never before. The incredibly talented folks at the US Geologic Survey Astrogeology Science Center harness the power of supercomputers and cloud computing to chew through more than 4,800 digital terrain models or DTMs and over 155,000 images of the Martian surface. To put this in context, it would take a standard personal computer between two and 35 years of continuous processing to generate these types of images. Supercomputers, however, do it in just a few weeks. It gets better though. The Higher Resolution Imaging Science Experiment, or HiRISE, also plays a role in contributing even sharper detailed images getting down to a crazy resolution of 25 centimeters or 9.8 inches per pixel. 
The fantastic thing overall with this release of data from the USGS is it's free to us all. So if you want to help contribute to scientific discoveries, check out the link in the description below and have fun. Well, that's it for now, with a nice hand-picked selection of amazing news to share with you. We always look forward to bringing you the latest developments in space news, but alas, next week we have to press pause briefly. We will be back into it the following week. Thanks for watching, and remember, onwards to the future. Really interesting passengers taking the trip. At least we know this bit be a good bit. Incredible imagery. Oh, I fell backwards. Hold on. Rough. Okay, I got this. Alright. <laughs> you guessed it. It's that time again when nope. is quite brand. <laughs> 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 Just like a PC monitor, just like a big screenshot or something. And there's a blooper. <laughs>